The following is a production of the University of North Carolina Wilmington Television through a grant to and in cooperation with South Carolina State University. The long, bloody struggle against Japan in the South Pacific Island campaigns of the Second World War for the first African-American Marines in the service of their country since the American Revolution. They trained on these grounds and in these buildings here at Munford Point, a segregated training base constructed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. They were ordinary men who faced extraordinary challenges with determination and courage. They struggled to gain acceptance as equals in a Marine Corps noted both for its battlefield exploits and its refusal to recruit African Americans. Out of that struggle emerged a unique group of men who hold a special place in the history of the Marine Corps and of the nation. I'm Louis Gossett, Jr., and I am privileged to bring you their story. We're fighting a war against the bigotry at home. We're fighting a war against the bigotry overseas. The first thing that happened to me the natives walked up to me and said, let me see your tail. The white Marines had told them that all black people had tails. We began to pull out the rifles and we taken charge and secured the area. We had a group of white Marines and they was very happy. And as they returned back, they stated, says, they asked them what happened. He said, the black angels saved us. And I remember Jimmy so well because Jimmy was killed on Iwo Jima. When Jimmy lost his life, it probably had not been Jimmy, it would have been me, because Jimmy was only two, two feet off my right shoulder. And it's a sad commentary to even think or say that. I prayed that they would have a war. You know, I, I just wanted a change. I, I thought there was something that I should prove. In 1942, with the United States at war with Germany and Japan, the Marine Corps remained the only branch of the service that refused to enlist African Americans. The men of Munford Point shattered the Corps' racist tradition, a tradition which existed since the American Revolution. Today, the Marine Corps is one of the most completely integrated institutions in the United States. There were black Marines in the Revolutionary War, there were three black Marines. They did duty on ship. After the War of 1775, blacks were no longer allowed in the Marine Corps. After the Revolutionary War, the United States forbade the enlistment of blacks in the nation's military. Although a few black militia men and sailors fought in the War of 1812, With the outbreak of the Civil War, military necessity changed that policy. 1862 saw the creation of the United States Colored Troops. And during the war, some 186,000 African Americans served in segregated army units. Another 15,000 served in the Navy. After the Civil War, the United States Colored Troops fought in the Indian Wars on the Western frontier where black cavalry units gained fame as the Buffalo Soldiers. Black troops also fought in the Spanish-American War in 1898 in Cuba. Some were Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders and in the Philippine Insurrection of 1899 to 1901. My father was a Spanish-American War veteran. He fought with Teddy Roosevelt. His name was William Green Holtzclaw. Over 367,000 African Americans served during World War I. Although the Army placed almost 90% of its black troops in segregated service units. 10,000 African Americans served in the Navy, primarily in the mess and stewards branches. Well, my dad was in the old 24th Army. See, he was one of the old Army guys retired from there. 
a powerful coalition of civil rights organizations, including the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the NAACP, and the Urban League, forced the Marine Corps to abandon its policy of excluding African Americans. President Franklin D. Roosevelt resisted the demands, but on June 25th signed Executive Order No. 8802. It forbade the defense industries or the government to refuse employment on the grounds of race, creed, color, or national origin. In a bow to Southern congressmen, it allowed continual racial segregation. Major General Thomas Holcomb, Commandant of the Corps, voiced the Corps' continuing objection to black enlistments. I quote, If it were a question on having a Marine Corps of 5,000 whites or 250,000 Negroes, he declared, I'd rather have the whites, unquote. Forced to accept black recruits, the Corps adopted a policy of rigid racial segregation rather than send black recruits to boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina, where white Marines trained. The Corps constructed a training facility for black Marines at Monfort Point on Camp Lejeune, a new base near the tiny coastal town of Jacksonville, North Carolina. The majority of the initial Montford Point recruits came from the South, although some came from the big cities of the North. They joined the Corps for reasons as varied as their backgrounds. Some like David Dinkins, former mayor of New York City, saw the Corps' combat training as the best preparation for surviving the war. Patriotism, the desire to see action, and the appeal to the Corps' dress blue uniform motivated others to join. So you, you never gave a thought to not going. And, uh, and so I said, well, the, the, and people were dying that you knew. So-and-so's big brother who lived across the street or around the corner. And I figured a way to stay alive is to be well-trained. And it made a well, the way to be well-trained is to be a Marine. And so I tried to enlist in the Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps because I felt it was the proper thing to do, a patriot, to be patriotic to my country. I felt that this was history in the making, and I felt that I wanted to be a part of it. Well, of course, the reputation of, uh, reputation of the Marines was known to be uh, rough and ready, and my mother asked me, why? I said, well, they're supposed to be first in battle, first back home, so I don't want to stay out too long. I joined the Marine Corps for two reasons. The dress blue uniform and the fact that they would see action. And I saw these uniforms, and I fell in love with those uniforms, and I told my two buddies, I said, look, man, don't you think that a black man would look good in those Marine Corps uniforms? Just look how it looks. It's got some red in it, it's got some blue, it, 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 it's just beautiful. Some didn't enlist, but were drafted into the Corps. I didn't join the Marines, the Marines selected me. Uh, I was in line being examined and uh, they had our records following us. And uh, when I was going down the line, a fellow reached over and says, uh, you come with me. Once enlisted, new Marines journeyed by train to small eastern North Carolina towns. Buses transported them to the final few miles to Jacksonville and Monfort Point. For those who lived in the South, it was just another trip through a segregated society they understood. Although some hoped that becoming a Marine might bring a new measure of respect from the whites. See, my parents were from Carolina, and uh, I had traveled the southern route a number of times by train or by auto. So actually, it was nothing strange, you know. I knew how the situation, I knew what to expect and what not, and we knew what the situation was, and so we governed ourselves accordingly. For those raised in the North, though they had heard about segregation, the train ride south delivered an abrupt, harsh, and unforgettable introduction to the reality of the Jim Crow South. I had to walk B train out in the yard someplace, about a yard away from, about a mile away from the station, and walk, I think it was about two o'clock in the morning, walk along the tracks to, to, to the station. 
an African-American man swept over. He was sweeping and he swept over to where I was. He looked at me and he says, uh, you have to move to the other side. So I went out the door and as I went out the door, something said, look, you know, look back. And I looked back, I looked over the station, the entrance to the station, and I saw a sign. It had to be about three feet in width and maybe five feet in length. And it said, for white only. Now I'd heard about things like that. I don't know where I can't, you know, pinpoint the exact person that told me that they had signs like that, that this was the South, but I'd never experienced it. And uh, that was the first time that the, 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 the realization hit me that this was a different world, that these were different people. I'd never seen anything like them. And the, the train pulled into Rocket Mount, the engine, along with our car, pulled way down the track. So we got off, and all and the, behind us were the coaches at all of the white pastors, and they in turn started into the train station, and not paying attention to what we were doing, we were kind of following the crowd until this big cop comes up to us and says, where are you? And he said, where the hell are you people think you're going? But he didn't say you people, he referred to us as diggers. He said, where are you going? And so we said, well, we're going in here to get something to eat. He says, well, you can't go in here, go around the side. So we weren't about to argue with him, and I was a long ways from home, so it was too far to run back, so I decided I would do what he said do. Got to Washington, D.C., they put us in a little straw coach, little straw backs. <laughs> Wasn't nothing in there, and I got to fussing about it because I, what our paper said, and this old lady said, son, you across the Mason-Dixon line now. I said, I don't mean nothing, I'm with the government. She said, that don't mean a thing down here. Arriving at Montford Point in August 1942, the first recruits found the facility still under construction, where they were assigned to temporary tent-like structures. So if I made it through the day, and then that night, uh, you put me in this uh, uh, hut. I'm stuttering because I wanted to call it a barrack. It wasn't a barrack, it was a hut. You couldn't really imagine being living in conditions like that. I mean, they were, they were, they were horrible. Uh, it looks like they were, uh, somebody got a, uh, a batch of cardboard and put it together with uh, staple guns or something like that. That's where we were supposed to live. And the sand and the mosquitoes were, I mean, they were terrible. You'd never experienced anything like that in your life. At Montford Point, the new recruits met an all-white staff of officers, non-commissioned officers and drill instructors. It included men with service in the Philippines, Nicaragua, and the Caribbean, who the Corps deemed experienced with colored troops. While Colonel Samuel A. Wood, as the initial commander of Munford Point, demanded that the black recruits receive the same rigorous training as their white counterparts, they encountered open hostility from some of the staff. Uh, they were chosen as Dan to be drill instructors because of their background and, and, and I might add, uh, most of these guys were from the South. Most of these guys were from Mississippi and Georgia. Uh, and uh, there were a few who really didn't want us in the Marine Corps, quite ob very envy uh, about allowing us black folk to enter into the Marine Corps. Now, I'm not saying the overwhelming majority, I would say there were just a few in stand who just didn't want the idea. Our officers were definitely prejudiced, particularly our captain. We had, well, three white officers, a warrant officer as well as the captain and uh, lieutenant. A captain uh, <clears throat> wasn't what I would consider thoughtful of his men because he wrote in a letter home that he didn't like serving with the niggas. I remember distinctly one person named was a lieutenant by the name of LaPointe, who uh, was very vicious in his reaction to us and in his demeanor and his language. I thought it was really inhumane. And that was another, on the, but on the opposite uh, end of the spectrum, we had a warrant officer by the name of Mr. Augustine. Now, he was paternal in his uh, treatment. However, there's no question that he was still a racist because when he used the term you people, he used it so derogatorily, it makes you want to vomit. 
Aware of the need to have African-American drill instructors, the court charges the white staff with identifying recruits with leadership potential to replace the original white drill instructors, a task accomplished by late 1943. The officer corps, however, remained all white, and the basic rule of racial etiquette at Montford Point never changed. At no time was a black man to be in a position to give orders to white Marines. If you were an African American and you listened to the Marine Corps, regardless of what your education, your training, your occupation was, you ended up there. So we had professors, we had lawyers, and people that had studied medicine that were in there. The transformation they wanted is that they wanted Afro-Americans to train Afro-Americans. And in picking them, I was glad and felt very fortunate to be picked as one of them. After I got out of boot camp, I went to NCO school, and after NCO school, I became a drill instructor. Determined to see the recruits emerge from boot camp, the equals of white Marines, black drill instructors increased the rigor of training. There were still a few whites around, but basically the black guys were now taking over. And we thought that would be good, but we found that that was worse than, uh, than having the white guys. Because they were, the blacks were determined to make us succeed and to be real Marines, and that was their main goal, was to be sure that we were going to be better than everybody else. It was all black, and I mean they were rough on us. I don't know, I guess the white must have told them how to do it, but they were really rough on us. As far as I'm concerned, they treat us like dogs because back in that day, we lied to hit on you, kick you and everything, and that was happening right there in boot camp. In addition to learning discipline, the new Marines trained in close order drill, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, with bayonets, on the rifle range, and with machine guns, anti-aircraft guns, and artillery pieces. Uh, then they issues you know, they marches through the, the uh, quartermaster uh, barracks, and of course they fit us real quick. You know, they slap something on your slap cap on your head, and, and if it didn't fall off, it fit. And uh, and they threw jackets at us. The guy just sized you up, and they threw jackets at us. And the training was uh, very intensive, and uh, they wanted you to, they gave you all phases of Marine Corps training, the same as all Marines got. The training and equipment and everything was equal, as far as I could see, uh, it's the, with all Marines. They didn't uh, spare any, anything on equipment and training. Everything was on the double. You ran everywhere. And uh, you didn't have too many, uh, uh, I say, uh, time, I, I heard someone say they had some leisure time. I didn't have no leisure time in boot camp. Every time I look up, they was doing something new every day of the week, seven days a week, we were out there. And then we went on to the rifle range. We got there, that's where we was using live bullets then. What you using, no fake bullets. We was using uh, duds or nothing like that. We was using real stuff, put you away. We already had training with the M1 rifle, when we was boot camp. So when it got to the carbines and all the other deals, and then of course the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. The 50 caliber, the 20 millimeter, all these are anti-aircraft uh, things were taught to us in the 51st Defense Battalion. And they, they were forming what you call depot companies, which was work crews, and ammunition companies would handle ammunition. But you had to go to school in order to be in those companies. We practice uh, around how to fight judo style. Uh, how to use a bayonet, and all the duck walking you could think of. We only got the, the opportunities to go through the training with the bayonet course and the rifle course and the, 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 the marching through the boonies. Hard bayonets! Munford pointers understood that failure was not an option, that they had to prove themselves the equal of white Marines. As a result, a close camaraderie developed among them, and they supported one another in their determination to become exemplary Marines. As, as far as the spirit's concerned, going through boot camp, I think most of the guys had a lot of high spirit. 
I believe all of the guys in my platoon were very enthusiastic and were determined to make it through. And I don't remember of any person in my platoon who did not actually participate and make it through all of the things that we needed to go through. It was more or less taken in the spirit of uh, this is what we've got to do and we're going to do it. Nothing is going to stop us. And collectively, as a group, we got together and says, we don't want anyone to fall up here because we're the pioneers of this experiment. And if we make it, others can make it after us. Their determination, tenacity, and performance eventually earned Montford Point recruits the respect and admiration of some of their initial critics within the white officer corps and among white Marines. They relieved our original CO, Colonel Stevenson, and put, us, put in charge a Colonel Leggett, who told us, it's a disgrace to be seen with boys like you. They had boys like you working on my plantation down in South Carolina. They tell me you have no discipline, you don't know what you're doing, but by God, since I gotta be with you, when I leave you, we are gonna see. And after almost that two years was up, and his tour of duty was halted, he had another uh, parade and apologized for his initial statement and said, I want you to know. I didn't want to leave you. He said, but I want you to know, I've never served with a better bunch of men in all my life. This Afro-American Marine was sitting in a seat on the bus, and this white lady wanted to sit down, and being the, the Afro-American Marine being in the rear of the bus, way we all had to sit. The bus driver told the Marine he had to get up and give the lady the seat, and he refused. But then the bus driver had a few words, said a few words to this young Marine, and went up to his front seat and came back with a, with a wrench of some sort, like he was going to hit the kid. And a few white Marines on the bus warned the bus driver not to touch the guy, not to touch the Marine. In need of recreational opportunities and acceptance as Marines after the rigors of boot camp, the Montford Point Marines found few recreational opportunities and no acceptance as Marines outside the camp. Typical of the rural segregated South, Jacksonville presented a hostile environment for black Marines as did other nearby southern towns. But segregation, hostility, the minute you left the camp to went to Jacksonville, that's when your problems started. It was just, it was hatred. You could see it on their faces, in their eyes. I mean, it was devastating. You take a kid, 17 years old, who had no background in that, and you subject him to something like that, you never forget it. I can I can I can never forget the, the the hate, the anger, the rage those people had in their face. They didn't even know me. It was just like one of our sergeants stopped a black girl to find out where the Western Union office was. And she told him when he come out, the police had him go to the car, rolled his rolled the window down and made him stick his hand in there and roll the window up on him and beat him. What why? Because that was their girlfriend. Dusty. Um Juke joints, whiskey joints, liquor joints, restaurants, all of those, and prostitution was uh, rampant and all of that. And that's where we spent our liberty, on that street. And you know, we go out off the street, we were considered out of bounds. And so therefore, we were confined to that one street. Matter of fact, if you were caught across the track going uptown, you were put in jail. White police, white MPs, and black MPs. I got lost, and so, Two white policemen drove up and says, hey, uh, you're kind of lost, ain't you, there? I said, 
yeah, I believe so, officer, instead of yes, sir. So the one that was not driving jumped out of the car and bam, when I looked up, I was looking up at the stars and boy, did he curse me roundly and soundly. So then, you know, naturally I wouldn't do anything about it because he had his pistol. He only wanted uh, an excuse to shoot me, certainly. Nor was the racial prejudice they encountered limited to the South. As they traveled westward and prepared to ship out to face the enemy, Montfort Point Marines encountered continued racial prejudice from both fellow Marines and civilians. We ended up at Camp Elliott in, uh, uh, right outside San Diego, I understand. The first day there, we went to the movie, open air movie, down in a ravine and we're told, sorry, but you boys got to sit in the back. Uh-uh, what do you mean? Well, that's the rule here, you boys have to sit in the back. The 33rd and the 34th Depot traveled together on a troop train from North Carolina going south toward New Orleans where we picked up German prisoners, two carloads of German prisoners. I always say they looked like Rommel's troop, big, tall, blonde, German and we headed out west. When we got somewhere in the west for a stop for either coal and water, uh, the Red Cross nurses came out to the train to uh, give us coffee and donuts. Our officer, our captain, who was white, he said, serve the Germans first. Our Red Cross nurses said, no, we'll serve our boys first. And I said to the first fellow who walked past me, I said, uh, do you guys get your Coke? You men get your Coke? And uh, I don't think he ever answered one way or the other. I knew he was disturbed about something, so I didn't say anything any more to him. So finally, uh, Jimmy stopped and he said to me, he, he said, Sarge, they wouldn't sell us any Coke. I said, what do you mean they wouldn't sell you any Coke? He said, no, there was a sign on the door, and the sign said, no Indians, Mexicans, niggers, or dogs allowed. More than 19,000 African Americans trained at Montford Point during World War II. Most hoped for combat and the opportunity to prove they deserved to be Marines. All of the early nearly 13,000 Montford Pointers assigned to duty overseas served in the Pacific Campaign against the Japanese almost never engaged the enemy. The 51st and 52nd Defense Battalions, the two combat units created at Montford Point were assigned guard duty on islands secured by white troops. The men in their ranks felt skin color and determined their lack of combat assignments. We were out in the sea for a couple of days before they informed us where we were going. We were going down to a group of islands. We found out it was 750 miles north of, of Samoa. It was called the Lisi Islands. We lead a uh, defense battalion down there. I don't know if it was the third or the fifth uh, defense battalion would relieve them. They left their guns in placements in place and then we took over everything there. I, I left the Marine Corps not with a bitter feeling but with a disappointed feeling. Here I was in an organization that sat on an island uh, for a year, almost two years with action all around us and, and, and we saw nothing. And, and, and when you train and train and train, you get to the point that, what's the use? Ironically, as American forces fought their way northward along island chains leading toward the Japanese homeland, it was members of ammunition and depot companies who saw combat. They supported amphibious landings on some of the Pacific War's bloodiest beaches, including Saipan, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. In the confusion of battle, ammunition carriers and depot company personnel became riflemen and stretcher bearers, removing both the wounded and the dead from the front lines. They protected beachheads and carried out their primary mission of transporting supplies and ammunition to the front line troops. On the battlefield, they faced an enemy unconcerned with their skin color and demonstrated their ability to perform as Marines. Because those bullets and all were coming, 
They didn't say these bullets for white and these bullets for black. Those bullets, you know what was on those bullets? To whomever they concerned. And those bullets were just as much concerned to us as they were to everybody else. Montford Point Marines received their first taste of combat and suffered their first casualties in the invasion of Saipan and the Mariana Islands. After an intense naval and air bombardment, American forces invaded on June 15th, 1944. We were just in a supporting unit those supports uh, to make sure that supplies and everything was available and uh, that we would keep the front lines and whatnot uh, supported with uh, the proper supplies they needed. I recall, you know, our raids and things like that. We lived in the foxhole everywhere we went. We had to dig in and stay. Uh, never lived in a, a, a hut, a tent, or anything like that. We were just in foxholes as we moved. And I spent a lot of time and doing guard of supplies. For instance, supplies have to go to the front. In what is perhaps the least known major battle of the Pacific campaign, American forces stormed ashore in Peleliu in the Palau Islands on September 15, 1944. Munford Point Marines participated in the invasion as members of the 11th Depot Company and of the 7th Ammunition Company. You, you, you got to get in the barges and go in with your rifles and everything. The ammunition stuff doesn't take place until after you take the island and settle. My company, when we went in, we went in with our rifles blazing. There, there's no secondhand nothing. Uh, we had uh, looked forward to uh, taking the airfield in a day or two. And there uh, was no such thing as that, you know. They, they were dug in, the enemy was dug in so strong until uh, everybody was held up at the beach. When we got ashore, first thing they do, you, you dig yourself a foxhole. You, you dig, try to get in the sand deep enough to where you wouldn't get hit, you know. And they just move you up as a, as a group then, I mean, as you could move up. Now, the only thing that was keeping us down, they had mortars that would come out on a track, They'd come out to, and they'd just, just drop mortars all over the place. We were supposed to go up on the front line, take ammunition up, bring the wounded, and if you had the opportunity, you bring the dead. What we was more concerned about the wounded is to bring them back uh, to the rear. We had a guy named, a big, great big guy from North Carolina named Oliver. And a Japanese came down and stumbled and fell in the tent <laughs> on him. <laughs> and he didn't make a sound. He just grabbed him and just, just choked him to death. Just laid there with him all the rest of the night. And they had to give him a shot in his arm to get his hands loose from the... <laughs> from the man's th throat the next morning, you know. The all-marine invasion force that shoved off on supporting fleet and headed for the beaches of Iwo Jima on February 19th, 1945, included Montford Point Marines. They too fought and died on the bloody sands of Iwo Jima. They too watched and cheered as the American flag was raised on Mount Suribachi to become an enduring symbol of American sacrifice and ultimate victory in the Pacific. As I say, when we got there, we could see early in the morning the bombing and strafing from the ships and from the aircraft. <clears throat> Flew a lot of these aircraft bombing the, uh, the island and Straightening the landing area. They were loading the assault troops. And they were circling in the water until 9 o'clock. And that's when the first wave would take off, heading to the beach. Uh, later in the afternoon, it was our turn. And there were three 
companies of uh, amphibious truck. Some guys went ashore in those. At least they started the show, anyhow. A lot of this truck was blown up before they got to the show. On February the 23rd, the night of February 23rd, we uh, hit shore and we lowered the, the front, the ramp. But a Japanese uh, mortar hit us about five times. We were loaded with ammunition in the hold, so the captain pulled away from shore. And the next morning, February the 24th, my birthday, we stepped on the island. And our job was to bury the dead. I didn't know. I was blown up in the air about eight or nine feet. Uh, I remember being unconscious in and out of it. I would black out, come to black out. I smelled the gunpowder in my nostrils and finally fell back to the deck. And uh, corpsmen were running, people were screaming and hollering. And finally, the corpsman came to me and he looked at me, checked me over, found that I'd been had some shrapnel on my on my on my left side, and found that I had some shrapnel in, on my shoulder. I can't write you up, send you back to the ship. He says you you'll be okay. So I just consider you the walking wounded. And took down the you know the information, my my rank, you know, and my unit and so forth and so on, for the Purple Heart. Uh, and that's where on D plus five when I saw in the distance, in the distance, the flag raising. To see that, uh, I guess I would say we took part in the jubilation, uh, the lights you've, you'll never see again, you know, one time to see these men just take off their helmets. Now I hear the Japanese, who are still entrenched, back in the caves of the Yonsei, and these guys were taking off their hats and tossing them up in the air. And here's shell fire coming all over the place there. Manfred Poirier's experienced not only the brutal combat of the Pacific War, they also glimpsed the horrors of war in the nuclear age. We were on our way to invade Japan when the uh, ceasefire was ordered. So instead of sending us back to the States, which we all said, when we were saying, California, here we come. But they didn't let it in in California, here we come. They said, Sasebo, Japan, here we come. We were sent to the homeland of Japan, to uh, Sasebo and Nagasaki, uh, Japan, to clean up the ash from the dropping of the atomic bomb. When we got there, I have never seen before and have never seen since. Such a devastating sight. Things were, were, were destroyed and, 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 and torn down and burnt. Another part of not only the land and the buildings and everything burned, but even some of the people. But some of them were sides of their faces were scarred. Where you would see they were burned uh, uh, and so forth. And uh, even the hands of some people were burned. The Montford Point Marines' courage and performance on the fire failed to alter the Corps' segregationist policies. Instead, the Corps reduced the number of blacks in its post-war force of 100,000 to less than 1,500 men. The battlefield performance, however, did earn the admiration of the white combat units they supported. It also caused individual white Marines to examine their racial prejudices. We were, I was on shore, uh, shore duty and he was on, on patrol and uh, we stopped and talked. And uh, he asked me, he says, uh, you know, he said, we can't understand you guys. I said, what do you mean? He said, now we were always told that you guys, uh, you know, you all couldn't get along, you're always fussing and fighting and cutting each other up. He says, y'all don't like that. I told him, you're learning. You find out we're human too. There was about four of us black Marines sitting around this white Marine, young, but you can see he was war weary or battle weary. And uh, I, I quote what he said, he says, I was taught differently, but now that I see you people here, I have respect for you. 
After World War II, throughout much of America, segregation was beginning to crumble. In 1948, President Harry Truman was in an uphill fight for re-election and under pressure from civil rights organizations to openly oppose segregation. Despite opposition from the segregated South, in July, he signed Executive Order 9981, requiring the desegregation of the military. As a result, Monfort Point closed as a training facility in September 1949. Elsewhere, the coal was slow to implement desegregation. Black Marines remained in segregated units and continued to face discrimination elsewhere. I'm vague on the month, but it, it, the latter part of the, the uh, 49 is maybe around the uh, August, somewhere in that time. We, we get, they started a troop train out of New Jersey. So when we get down to California, we got a troop train that's long. I mean, we have all these Marines picked up along the way. But we get into to Camp Pendleton, we start to get all, off the, the train. The Marines there are standing out waiting on us. And the first thing I heard out of their mouth, here come them nigger Marines. When North Korea invaded South Korea in June 1950, the United States led a United Nations force which responded to the attack. With the Korean War, the Marine Corps finally integrated its ranks. Men trained at Montford Point integrated the Corps at unit level, breaking yet another racial barrier. On the battlefield, Marines concentrated on staying alive, not the skin color of others in their outfit. So the racial problem wasn't over there. That, you know, I know I was black, but that's all. Okay. But the fighting part was the problem, and, and we had to survive. I mean, we had to survive. And, and yeah, I used to lay there, and I got back on patrol, and, uh, and, and meditate on how I was going to get through that day or that night. On September 15th, 1950, General Douglas MacArthur launched an offensive against the invading North Koreans with an amphibious landing at Incheon, a harbor town in South Korea's west coast. For the first time, men trained at Montfort Point stormed the shore as frontline troops in an integrated Marine invasion force. The first uh, thing popped in my mind is now uh, looking, uh, the, uh, the Marines are ahead of us. We went in on, uh, I think, about the 13th wave. Uh, the ones that pulled us, uh, a lot of those guys were killed, and those bodies were just stacked up. You see these guys getting killed. But the strange thing about it, you really don't think about Dan, I mean, your job now becomes a uh, survival. And we landed and moved up and supported the 5th and the 1st Marines, so securing and taking a soul, surrounding soul, and all the way up to the 38th parallel. My job at that time with 3.5 rockets and flamethrowers, in which we didn't use the flamethrowers too much, but the rockets we used. I was a rocket launcher, rocket man. The, we were chasing some Chinese through the mountain area, and we set up that night for camp, and they walked right in, a, a battalion of Chinese walked into our company. And we, uh, and this night, it was a lot of uh, heroic things going on, I suppose, if you would call it that, whether we had to fight them off in order to uh, survive. Monfort Point Marines fought in the Chosin Reservoir Campaign, one of the most brutal in Marine Corps history. In late October, 1950, Hundreds of thousands of Chinese soldiers stormed across the Yellow River into North Korea, overrunning American positions and forcing a general retreat. Fighting in the bitter cold, American troops sustained heavy casualties as they successfully broke through enemy lines to rejoin Allied forces. And we were near the uh, reservoir when the Chinese crossed over. And that's uh, where the Chinese entered the war during that particular period. I never will forget, I mean, it wasn't nothing easy, it wasn't nothing wonderful. It's cold all the time, freezing to death. 
and all that. And I, I didn't see nothing real about it, but you know, I was I was there, so to speak. But those Chinese came across in thousands, and thousands, and thousands, and thousands. But but at that time, they were had us around completely cut off. Now it's about thirty some below zero. When they finally got us out of there, what they kept asking me over and over again, do you, how your feet feel? As long as you feel you have feel in your feet, you pretty well okay. But when your feeling disappear, then that means you, you're frozen. I said, when they got ready to take me out, I said, I'm okay, I don't have feeling at all. They said, you and we won't because we know what's happened to you, your, your feet are frozen. When, when they took my boot off, it was frozen. And the boot came off and part of my foot came off with it. So there, that, that's where I lost all my toes. As the Korean War ended, the nation, too, was experiencing a fundamental change in race relations. In 1954, the Supreme Court declared segregated public schools unconstitutional. A year later, in Montgomery, Alabama, African Americans began a decade-long struggle for equality in the streets of the South's major cities. The 1963 March on Washington and televised white violence against African Americans moved a nation. In 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act finally outlawing segregation in the United States. While racism continued to haunt both the nation and the core, legal segregation was dead, and the Marines of Montford Point had helped to kill it. As the nation struggled to end segregation, Montford Point Marines fought in their third and final war in Vietnam. Racial tensions continued to exist, but the Marine Corps had changed dramatically. In Vietnam, they served in a Marine Corps they could only have imagined as raw recruits at Montford Point. They fought in fully integrated units, at times commanded by black officers. It was a Marine Corps their courage, determination, and sacrifice had created. That now, I lost a lot of troops in Vietnam. Uh, went in personnel, take over personnel office in the, uh, in the battalion. The job there was casual reporting and so forth. You do the casual report and report there. We wrote our uh, condolence letters, perforated the condolence letters. We uh, also had to, my job was also, that saddest job was you had to go to the morgue and identify a lot of bodies. And the bar, and the bar, and the, Black bags, this was a sad type of duty. It wasn't nothing proud, it wasn't nothing happy about it. Uh, during my second tour in Vietnam, I was a, I was a designated uh, crew chief on the transport helicopter. I was assigned the duties of going uh, back and forth uh, to the different areas, uh, Khaesan especially, uh, Ubai, Cam Key, and other places. I, I, I remember especially Quezon going in and out of Quezon, and especially one time when I went in, we had a hundred, about 186 holes in our aircraft. When I served in Vietnam, there was a stark difference insofar as racial attitudes and racial treatment were concerned. By that time, of course, the Marine Corps was totally desegregated in all aspects and all areas. Um, there was no such thing as, uh, uh, as segregation because we'd go where we wanted, where we wanted to go and with whom we pleased. There was, there was no racial uh, animosity exhibited uh, in Vietnam. Maybe an occasion, maybe when a guy might have too much to drink, uh, he would resort to racial epithets and racial slurs and racial remarks. We were all Marine, we were all buddies, we were all looking out for one another. For the men of Montford Point, the memories of their experiences together are deeply personal, powerful, and unforgettable. Montford Point shaped them into a unique brotherhood. They are now part of the Marine Corps' tradition and identify with its reputation as the nation's mythic warriors. They are proud of their service in three wars. They know 
that what they endured made possible a career in the Marine Corps for future generations of African Americans. They understand that their experience as Munford Point Marines helped end segregation in America. Whether they remained in the Corps or returned to civilian life, Munford Point shaped their character and careers. And I don't regret going into the Marine Corps and being one of the first Afro-Americans in the Marine Corps in making history. It wasn't easy. And we had problems. And there's still a few wrinkles in the sheet that have to be ironed out. My experience in the Marine Corps was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. I think the Marine Corps did a lot for me because it was tough. And being a black Marine, it was even tougher. But I appreciate what the Marine Corps did for me because I think it made a better man out of me. Well, in 1943, when I saw a black with one stripe on, well, I felt great. But when I saw all that brass, the generals and the colonels and the majors and all, I cried. And I, I, I each day, I, I tell my young people as I walk around, I paid for the things that you are going to hear, receiving today, and the opportunities you have. So you don't have to go out here doing what I did in the Marine Corps, wishing for war to prove to someone that you can make a change, that you can do the same thing that everyone else can do. You don't have to take the, the abuse or sit on the back of a bus or to go into Jacksonville or any other place in the world. We don't have to do that anymore. And I tell them, you don't have to prove. I've already gone through this and you don't have to prove anything to anybody in the world. Time has depleted the ranks of the men of Montford Point. In ever decreasing numbers, they attend the annual meeting of the Montford Point Marines Association, formed in 1965 to preserve their legacy. There they renew old friendships, reminisce about Montford Point, recall hardships endured, and remember those no longer in their ranks. There they meet Marines who joined the Corps after 1949 men whose careers they made possible. To those who came after them, the original Montford Pointers are legends, honored, respected, and admired. The men of Montford Point remind us of the determination, courage, and sacrifice required to secure the blessings of liberty and equality for all Americans. They are aware of their unique place in the nation's history, and they remain proud to have been Montford Point Marines. <laughs>